Today's sermon is Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 18, but uh, we have to look at chapter 5, verse 20 as well, um, where Jesus says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness <clears throat> exceeds or is greater than that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your words, the words of your Son, Jesus. Help us to receive his instruction, his teaching uh, in our hearts. Help us to believe his words and apply them to our lives. In Christ's name, amen. So again, 520, unless your righteousness is greater than that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, and then Jesus gives these six examples in chapter 5 of ways that the Pharisees and scribes probably were interpreting and applying the, the, the commandments in a not so good way. And Jesus says, here's how you should really interpret and apply these commandments uh, to have a greater righteousness than them, to have a righteousness that's not just an exterior righteousness, but a righteousness that is from the heart, a whole person righteousness. So that's chapter 5. Now in chapter 6, he, he begins uh, by saying, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. And then he gives three examples of, of piety or ways that uh, Jews and you know, followers of Jesus w w practiced or lived out their righteousness, giving to the needy, a praying and fasting. And, and so, um, yeah, th these are, th it's a little bit different than chapter 5 where it focused on interpreting the Old Testament. Now he's talking about what greater righteousness looks like as you live it out, as you practice your piety in life. And, and apparently the Pharisees and scribes, they, they love to practice their piety so long as other people were watching and could give them praise and glory. And that's why Jesus tells his disciples, uh, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you'll have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Now sometimes we, we, people read this verse and they remember 516 where Jesus said, In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And they might think, okay, so which is it? Is this a contradiction? And, and it kind of seems like it, but what we learn as we keep reading is that what Jesus is after here is our heart motivation. And the key phrase in chapter 6, verse 1, is that we shouldn't do these good works in order to be seen by others and receive praise and glory for them. He, Jesus wants our lives to be full of love and good works. And a, a good portion of our lives will be lived in front of other people. And so, of course, we're going to be doing good works, acts of piety in front of others. But... Our motivation should not be to impress them and that so that they'll think that we're really great instead sure let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and give glory to God in heaven the whole purpose should be so others may glorify God not so that they may glorify you do you see the difference I think that's the difference between these uh, seemingly contradictory passages and then um, one other thing <clears throat> Jesus says beware or uh, be in a state of alert so that your righteousness, so that you don't practice your righteousness before others to be seen by them. Um, Tim Keller was once preaching on a passage where Jesus said, beware of all greed and covetousness. And Tim Keller said, you know, Jesus doesn't say beware of committing adultery because you know, you'll know if you're committing adultery, <laughs> but you might not know if you are being greedy or full of covetousness. And I just thought that was so insightful. And, and the same thing applies here. Jesus says, beware of doing this. You know, we might be unaware of how we have this tendency to practice our righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. And so we need Jesus to tell us, hey, watch out for this. Check your hearts. If this is what you've been doing, if this is the motivation of your heart, then, then you'll have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. And then he gives three examples. The first one is about giving to the needy in verses 2 through 4. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, 
Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. Okay? So, if you give to... Now, giving to the needy was commanded by God in the Old Testament to, to, to give to the poor and needy in their land. And, and all good Jews practice that. Um, <clears throat> The thing was, some of these Pharisees and hypocrites were making a big deal about how much they were giving to the needy, and they wanted to be seen by others. Jesus said, if you do that, and that's your reason for doing it, you have received your reward in full. There will be no reward from your Father in heaven. Uh, but he says, but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Which is just a way of saying, don't be showy about it. Uh, don't, don't call attention to yourself when you're giving. This doesn't mean that you have to give all your gifts to church in cash so that no one can see where the check comes from. It doesn't mean that when it comes time to drop off your Operation Christmas Child box that you have to wear a ski mask or come in the middle of the night. Let's not take this to the extreme, but, but I think you know what he's getting at. Don't When you give to the needy or to church or whatever, don't do it in a way that calls attention to yourself to be seen and praised by others. Do it in a way that's secret so that your father who sees in secret will reward you. What I find interesting in this whole chapter is that it's like Jesus knows that we all desire to be recognized for our good deeds. And, and he doesn't outright condemn that, but he does condemn seeking recognition and praise from other people here on earth, right? To be seen by others and to be praised by them. But he does say it's okay to, to, to be recognized by your Father in heaven. When we give in secret, he says, um, your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And why else would Jesus say that but to encourage us to seek that reward from our Heavenly Father? And so I think that's really neat. And sometimes I think we miss that, that we can and should be motivated by this promise that God will reward us for our good deeds um, done, not in a hypocritical way, but in a sincere way. Um, I want to talk about rewards a little bit because this can be confusing and it is confusing what does jesus mean here when he says and your father who sees in secret will reward you uh, some people think this just applies to, to the reward of heaven that all christians will receive i think he's not just talking about that but um but about extra you know heavenly rewards, uh, glory that, that he will give to some Christians in heaven for their service, for their endurance of suffering. Um, the reason I say that is because um, all Christians, everyone who believes in Jesus, receives heaven by grace, through faith, apart from any works of our own. We don't receive heaven because of our works at all. We receive heaven and eternal life because of the work of Jesus Christ, who lived the perfect life, who suffered and died for our sins upon the cross and who rose again on the third day. And we who believe in him receive his work on our behalf. And that's why we uh, receive eternal life and receive heaven. But it seems there are some places like here and other places where Jesus promises uh, rewards in heaven for those who serve him faithfully. 1 Corinthians 3 is one example of this. Um, another one from Luke 19, the parable of the ten minas or talents, where Jesus ends up saying to, you know, two of them, you know, you, you, you've been faithful in little, I will, I will now set you over, or I'll give you authority over 10 cities or over five cities. You know, it seems to be saying something about greater responsibility or rewards in heaven. Um, I looked up Luther on this passage too, and, and he was adamant to say that, yes, we all receive grace, forgiveness of sins, and eternal life completely by grace, through faith in Jesus for what he has done. But then he went on to say it is true that God promises heavenly rewards, blessings, or, or greater glory to those Christians who serve him faithfully, tirelessly, and, and especially those Christians who suffer for righteousness sake. Um, he said that, yeah, in heaven, will receive different rewards and, and and for instance the glory of saint paul and he will he will shine brighter than, than other christians and there will be distinctions like that and that that's what jesus is teaching here and and notably luther says the purpose of this teaching on rewards is to console and comfort us when we feel like giving up 
or when we're suffering, uh, that we are to remember that that our Heavenly Father sees in secret and he promises <clears throat> to reward, reward us. Well, we've talked about giving to the needy. The next example Jesus talks about is prayer. That's in verses 5 through 6. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. So again, the same principle applies. You know, when you pray, don't do it to show off so that others will be impressed by you. Um, now, is this a condemnation of all praying in public? Probably not, because there are several examples in the Bible of either Jesus or the disciples or apostles or prophets or kings praying in front of other people. Sometimes that's necessary, especially when we come together for worship or for a Bible study. It's necessary that one or a few people pray on behalf of the whole group. But our heart attitude should not be to pray in such a way to impress others so that they'll think we're really holy or righteous or something like that. Um, but verse 6 is, is an encouragement to private prayer. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, I don't think we often think about that, that, that Jesus here promises that God will reward us for praying to our Father in heaven in secret. Let, let that be just one more reward and, and motivation for us to pray to our God. We already know that we, we pray because God, our Heavenly Father, loves to hear and answer the prayers of his children. We already know that we should pray because we are weak and, and, and uh, full of uh, sinful nature and the, the world and the devil, so we need help. We, need, we depend upon God. Um, here we can also pray because we know that God promises to reward us uh, for, for praying to him. Well, then Jesus kind of goes and he expands on his teaching on prayer even more. Four months ago, I prayed, uh, I mean, I preached a three-part sermon on prayer, including this passage, so I will not preach on this passage, but I will read it for, you, for us now. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Okay, so... That's very important teaching on prayer. He gives us the Lord's Prayer or the model prayer for us to pray and to base our prayers upon. Again, I preached on it four months ago. You can look up my sermons on YouTube uh, on the Lord's Prayer. I'm going to continue now with his third example of piety, verses 16 through 18. <clears throat> and when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Fasting was a common practice of piety in the days of Jesus. Many Jews, uh, I think they were commanded to fast in connection with some feast days, uh, we know that some of the Pharisees made a practice of fasting twice a week, like, uh, like the man in the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Jesus assumes that his disciples will fast or be fasting just like he assumes that they will be praying and giving to the needy. Uh, there is a time in Matthew 9, I believe, where, yeah, some people asked Jesus why uh, why he and his disciples don't why his disciples don't fast and he said well they don't now because the bridegroom me I'm with them but when I'm gone then they will fast and sure enough as we read in in the book of Acts we see 
examples at various times of the disciples and Christians fasting. One of them is in uh, Acts 13, when uh, the church in Antioch, it says this, they, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. We see here that the church in Antioch fasted and prayed uh, that God likely would grant favor to the missionary journey uh, of Saul and Barnabas. And so fasting and prayer go together. Um, it's a very important practice. Um, it seems like people practice it a lot more in Jesus' day than in our day. Um, though I could be wrong about that, maybe just today, uh, the truth is that Christians are really good at following Jesus' commandment here and only fasting in secret, not letting others know about it. Uh, somehow I don't think that's the case. <laughs> maybe we should fast more. Um, it's one of those things that's not explicitly commanded, but it's like, like I said, it's assumed that we will fast from time to time. And there's great benefit to fasting. Um, one of the benefits of fasting is... Uh, is that it, it, it helps our body, it trains our body to exercise self-control. Because when we fast, obviously we become hungry and yet we don't give in to that hunger. And that can train our bodies. Uh, it can show us and teach us that we don't need to give in to everything that we desire. Um, for instance, sexual desire or, or a gluttonous desire or, or a desire for, for praise from other people, whatever it might be. We have lots of desires that are not good that the Bible teaches us not to give in to. And fasting, so long as we conjoin fasting with prayer and dependence on God and the Holy Spirit, it can really train our bodies for self-control. Also, people connect fasting with just a greater time to spend in prayer and in reading the Bible. Some people pray and fast for a specific purpose, like that church in Antioch prayed and fasted for Barnabas and Saul and for success on their missionary journey. Um, some Christians and, and others have fasted and prayed that God would send rain in a period of drought. Many Christians have taken time to fast and pray that God would bring about revival, renewed spiritual life in their communities, in their countries. Uh, many Americans, uh, evangelicals and Catholics have spent time fasting and praying that God would put an end to abortion in our land. Um, Many Christians make fasting and prayer a regular part of their devotional life, and it helps, helps them uh, to, to depend upon God and to, and to look to Him. And so I guess I would encourage us to begin to do this more often. Though we hear the warning from Jesus not to be like the hypocrites who disfigure our faces and let everyone know that we're fasting. In that case, we will have no reward from our Father who is in heaven. Well, uh, we've come to the end of our passage, and Jesus has given us these three examples um, of ways not to, to show our righteousness in a hypocritical way. Um, and he, just, he gives us three examples, but the same principles could apply to other uh, spiritual or pious practices as well. I think of one of the most popular ones today um, is the practice of having a quiet time or a time of daily devotions. That is where we read the Bible and pray uh, each day. That's a wonderful practice because we read God's word and we pray. That's a wonderful thing. But in our sinful natures, we have all these ways where we can turn a good thing into a bad thing. If we use our daily quiet time uh, as a way to, to impress others, right? We want to be seen by others. How many of you on Facebook or Instagram have seen people's pictures of their great quiet time set up. They got their, you know, their Bible and they got their, their coffee mug and, and, you know, maybe they've got some latte art in it or something and, you know, hashtag quiet time or blessed. It's like, that's not necessary. Okay. Next time you see that on social media, I dare you to, to comment. Truly, truly, I say to you, you have received your reward in full. <laughs> okay. Probably don't do that, but it would be really funny if you did. Um, this warning applies to us in all different aspects of, of, of our lives as we live out um, piety or, or righteousness or devotion to God. Again, the theme verse is 6-1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. We all desire to be praised and honored and glorified by other people. In this chapter, Jesus teaches us that we don't need that. All that matters 
is that we seek God and that we have his approval. The gospel teaches us that we have God's approval. We have his unmerited favor through faith in his son, Jesus Christ, who has died for our sins and, and been raised again. And, and even beyond that, Jesus promises that our Heavenly Father will reward us with end-time blessings uh, for, for seeking Him, for practicing our righteousness, not in a hypocritical way, but, but, but in a way that, that truly stems from hearts that love God and that love our neighbors. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, help us to live in a way that pleases you. Uh, help us not to be so attracted to receiving praise and glory from others, but help us to seek the glory and praise that, that comes from you and your Father. In your name we pray. Amen.